On May 29th, 2011, the racing world once again awoke to the greatest day in motorsports. What we all didn't know was the fact that we were in store for some of the most heartbreaking losses imaginable in racing. Two races in two different forms of motorsport mirroring one another in one of the most odd ways probably ever seen. The Indianapolis 500 for IndyCar and the Coca-Cola 600 for NASCAR. Starting in Indy, Alex Tagliani would lead the field to the green, but the two that needed the most historical focus on this day would be that of the late Dan Weldon starting in 6th and the youthful rookie J.R. Hildebrand starting in 12th. For the opening part of the day, Tagliani and Scott Dixon showed the way, leading all of the opening 60 laps, trading it back and forth throughout the early part of the day. But this didn't stop any of the fact that the insane action that was seen throughout the field, well, it lent itself to the entirety of the pack through the entirety of the day. The first yellow of the day coming from Takuma Sato hitting the wall on the 21st lap. This only a lap after Paul Tracy tagged the wall as well from getting too high up. The chaos of pit road would see costly errors, like with Will Power, and this chaos kept up under green as the on the ensuing restart, EJ Vizo slammed into the turn one wall. As green flight conditions resumed for a longer span of time, the dominant cars were flexing their muscles. Dario Franchitti and Dan Weldon starting to charge up nearing the race's quarter mark. At this point, as well, the aforementioned Hildebrand sat just outside the top 15. He was quiet for most of the day. It would be around lap 60 where another twist came into play, as while the leaders were pitting, Jay Howard's number 88 was creamed inside the inside wall, coming out of the pits. As the field went back to green flag racing, the Ganassi teammates of Scott Dixon and Dario Franchitti swapped the lead back and forth. But by the race's halfway point, Dixon was the dominant man, but much of the talk was actually on the speed of Dan Weldon's number 98. Another round of pit stops shuffled up the field as well as another wreck brought out the yellow, this time from James Hinchcliffe. All of this helped Franchitti continue to retain the lead, at least for the time being. And what it also led to was the longest run of green flag laps of the day at 41. This of course ending with the first of the final two cautions. Alex Tagliani crashing coming out of turn four right above J.R. Hildebrand as he got too high and into the marbles and a two car incident with Ryan Briscoe and Townsend Bell. With 36 to go, the green flag came out for the final time. Graham Rahal running off with the lead to start with before Dixon would run him down again. But this doesn't last long as alternate pit strategies would lead to the main leaders pitting with around 20 laps left, handing the lead to fan favorite and international superstar Danica Patrick. Patrick had a great moment leading, but it wouldn't matter as she was four to five laps short on fuel. Her team was merely delaying the inevitable, so with 12 to go, Bertrand Baguette would scream by her, Frankidi quickly behind him in second, and then Hildebrand. Coming to three to go, the leader would pit, but Frankidi wasn't the driver who would inherit the lead. Instead, J.R. Hildebrand would be the one, and Hildebrand would keep it to two to go then to the white flag. Behind him, Dan Weldon charged to a final lap that will now live on forever. Oh, baby, bring it home. Keep going. The 23-year-old from Sausalito, California. Listen to the crowd cheer him on. And how fitting for the National Guard car to win if he can indeed do that. If he got enough fuel to make it to the end. Half a lap. He's got a half a lap to go and he's the Indy 500 champion. Panther racing. Oh, so good. They finish second here. Twice here they come again through the final two corners. J.R. Hildebrand. Their more the traffic. He's got to get around the lap. Traffic. Unbelievable. 
Like what happened above him to Tagliani earlier in the race, Hildebrand got into the outside marbles and crashed off the final turn of the final lap. This handed the win to the late Dan Weldon, while the National Guard car finished second. But in an insane twist of events, a similar occurrence would take place a few hours later, only about 600 miles southeast at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. In this race, two main players would define the night in the history books, Kevin Harvick and Dale Earnhardt Jr. Harvick having a great season, winning twice already in throwing fashion at Auto Club in Martinsville. Dale Jr. having a rebound season following a terrible two and a half year stint. While being a top three to five driver in 2011 thus far, Earnhardt still was in the midst of the longest losing streak of his career at this point at 104 races. And where better to break it then than in front of his hometown crowd in Charlotte, North Carolina? The opening half of the race was relatively clean. Guys like Edwards, Hamlin, and Matt Kenseth owned the top spot for much of the daylight hours. The big goal early in the race was just to stay on the lead lap. If you stayed on the lead lap until the nighttime came, you were a contender for the win. During green flag stops, with about 167 to go, Mike Bliss ran out of fuel and stopped just before hitting the pits. Kurt Busch stayed out during the sequence, and a lot of different guys were trapped a lap down, including that of Kevin Harvick. But what this yellow also did was open the floodgates of insanity. On the ensuing restart, the first of a relative rash of cautions began compared to the early part of the race. This time being a Paul Menard spin that ended up collecting Martin Truex Jr. and Brian Vickers. In this time, Kyle Busch had control of the race, with guys like David Reagan and Dale Jr. getting faster behind him. At around 120 to go, green flag pit stops peppered the field. But once again, the caution came out during this green flag stint of stops. So again, the field strategy would be flipped on its head, much like Indy was. Only a few laps later would see David Starr's car get absolutely demolished by Casey Kane. The aggression throughout the entire pack was swelling up at all levels. So there'd be no surprises with more crashes like that of Landon Castle's 09 car, as well as the one between David Gilland, Mark Martin, and Ryan Newman. While a bad accident, our big players and Harvick and Jr snuck by just barely below this crash. This crash very well could have prevented what was to come. But what it did was again shuffle up both the field and its strategies as with 90 to go, the laps began to click by. This proved too much for Kyle Busch, who would be trapped in the back, losing the handling of his car and spin through the trial of grass with 80 to go or so. Unlike Castle though, he would actually be able to continue. With the laps clicking by, Casey Kane, Kevin Harvick, Greg Biffle, Dale Jr., and Matt Kenseth were the five guys to beat and the ones who were looking to get the win. What made all of this more interesting is Kyle Busch spun again right on the fuel window, so everyone was cutting it close. Much like Indy, the race may come down to strategy. With only 52 laps left, the field returned to green, with it being Gordon versus Biffle and Biffle would quickly gain the upper hand. Kane followed him quickly, and for the first time all night, a long green run looked to be imminent. Biffle and Kane both were stable in their gaps between each other. Most were starting to conserve fuel throughout the pack if they weren't up with these main leaders. Most with the exception of Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Matt Kenseth, who seemed at the time like they could make it to the end, or maybe they just knew they couldn't make it and said, screw it, let's go fast with it. With 23 to go, Dale Jr. passed David Reagan for third, and it was go time. The 16 and the 4 were saving, and there was an opportunity to pounce and finally get a win. With under 20 to go, Kane was catching Biffle, Jr. was catching Kane, and Kenseth was catching the 88. It looked to be a barn burner. Well, for most, as until at least Kenseth was drawn into the pits with eight to go, leaving it to three to go for the win with seven laps left. But all this would be for naught, as Jimmy Johnson's engine would expire in a cloud of smoke. The longest race in NASCAR would get a bit longer with a green-white checker finish. The top guys were right on the edge, saving fuel under the final yellow flag of the night. 
The first to bail out, though, would be Greg Biffle, who had to jump down to the pits. It would now be Kane versus Earnhardt for the final restart. But as the green came out, Kane sputtered and didn't go. The National Guard car once again shot out of a cannon to the lead. The last win Junior had was a fuel mileage dub in 2008. Would this be the same? Dale Earnhardt Jr. out front. Can he make it? White flag. Next flag ends the race. Hamlin trying to close. Track's clear. We're good to go. Seven back. Seven back. Harvick third. Reagan fourth. Logano fifth. What a topsy-turvy finish to the Coca-Cola 600. And Dale Jr. is scooting away. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. He's slowing, isn't he? 150,000 people on their feet. Junior Earnhardt. is slowing. He's out of fuel. He's out, He's of, out of gas. And as that Indy, the leader at turn four, does not get to the flag. Perfect. Perfect. The closer wins it. In front of over 100,000 of his hometown fans, NASCAR's favorite son ran dry on fuel. For the second time in 2011, Harvick would beat Earnhardt in heartbreaking fashion, and the losing streak would go on. But more incredibly, both National Guard cars snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. You would be hard-pressed to find a day in the history of racing where the same sponsor lost two of the biggest races in the world on the same day by only a couple hundred feet from the finish line in both races. As for the drivers all involved, J.R. Hildebrand, as of today in 2022, has never reached victory circle in his IndyCar career. Dale Earnhardt Jr. would eventually break a 143 race winless streak at Michigan the next year in 2012 and continue his career renaissance before a 2017 retirement. As for the winners, well, it was a forked road of triumph and tragedy. In IndyCar, Dan Weldon didn't have a full-time ride in 2011, so at the time, Indy just seemed like a hell of a one-off. But in the later part of the season, he would get opportunities, and it would be announced that he'd have a full-time ride in 2012 for Andretti Autosport to replace Danica Patrick, who was going over to NASCAR. Unfortunately, this never came to be, as on the 11th lap of the race in Las Vegas, a horrific 15-car wreck claimed his life at only 33 years old. On the other side, in NASCAR, Kevin Harvick has since won 41 more races in the Cup Series since this race, as well as the 2014 title. With 58 career Cup wins, Harvick sits in the top 10 of the all-time wins list and second among active drivers in the NASCAR Cup Series today. Now, with all of this, I'm going to pass it on to you. What do you think of the two most thrilling moments in recent motorsports history, also having one of the most insane coincidences to tie them together as well. Let me know down in the comments below. While you're at it, leave a like on this video, share this video, and subscribe to the channel for more great racing content. And to all my channel members, thank you so much for all of your support. And until next time, have a good one.